The Lacanian Subject by Bruce Fink. Chapter 9. The Four Discourses. There is no whole. Nothing is whole. That was a quote from Lacan. There's no such thing as a universe of discourse. Another quote from Lacan. There's no such thing as a meta-language. And you guessed it, that was another quote from Lacan. Lacanian psychoanalysis constitutes a very powerful theory and a socially significant practice. Yet it is not a Welton Shang, a totalized or totalizing worldview, though many would like to make it such. It is a discourse and as such has effects in the world. It is but one discourse among many, not the final ultimate discourse. The dominant discourse in the world Today is no doubt the discourse of power. Power is a means to achieve X, Y, and Z, but ultimately power for power's sake. Lacanian psychoanalysis is not in, in and of itself a discourse of power. It deploys a certain kind of power in the analytic situation, a power that is unjustifiable according to many American schools of psychology, wherein the client's autonomy, read ego, is sacrosanct, and must remain untrammeled and unchallenged. Psychoanalysis deploys the power of the cause of desire in order to bring about a reconfiguration of the analysis desire. As such, analytic discourse is structured differently from the discourse of power. Lacan's four discourses seek to account for the structural differences among discourses, and I will turn to this accounting in a moment. First, let me raise the question of relativism. If psychoanalysis is not somehow the ultimate discourse, being but one discourse among others, what claim can it make to our attention? Why should we bother to concern ourselves with analytic discourse at all, if it is just one of several or one of many? I will provide but one simple answer here, because it allows us to understand the functioning of different discourses in a unique way. Before taking up the particulars of Lacan's four discourses, let me point out that, while Lacan terms one of his discourses the hysterics discourse, he does not mean thereby that a given hysteric always and inescapably adopts or functions within the hysterics discourse. As an analyst, the hysteric may function within the analyst's discourse. As an academic, the hysteric may function within the discourse of the university. The hysteric psychical structure does not change as he or she changes discourses, but his or her efficacy changes. Situating him or herself within the analyst's discourse, his or her effect on other others corresponds to the effect allowed by that discourse and suffers from the obstacles and shortcomings endemic to that discourse. A particular discourse facilitates certain things and hinders others, allows one to see certain things while blinding one to others. Discourses, on the other hand, are not like hats that can be donned and doffed at will. The changing of discourses generally requires that certain conditions be met. An analyst does not always function within analytic discourse. Insofar, for example, as he or she teaches, the analyst could very well adopt the university discourse or the master's discourse, or for that matter, the hysterics discourse and Lacan's own teaching often seems to come under this latter head. One thing that is immediately striking is that, while Lacan forges a discourse of the hysteric, there is no such discourse of the obsessive neurotic, phobic, pervert, or psychotic. Their discourses can no doubt be formalized to some extent, and Lacan went a long way towards formalizing the structure of fantasy and phobia, perversion, and so on. Yet there are not primary focus... Yet they are not primary focuses of the four major discourses he outlines. I will not go into the four discourses in all their complexity, especially as concerns their development over time from Seminar uh, 17, where they are introduced, to Seminar 20 and beyond, where they are somewhat reworked. Instead, I shall present the basic features of each of the four discourses, and then in the next chapter, discuss a second way of talking about different kinds of discourses that Lacan presents in Seminar 21. The Master's Discourse Lacan's discourses begin, in a sense, with the discourse of the master, 
both for historical reasons and because it embodies the alienating function of the signifier to which we are all subject. As such, it holds a privileged place in the four discourses. It constitutes a sort of primary discourse, both phylogenetically and ontogenetically. It is the fundamental matrix of the coming to be of the subject through alienation, as we saw in chapters 4 to 6. But Lacan ascribes to it a somewhat different function in the context of his four discourses. And now there's a mathematical formula that I'm not going to read to you because... I just can't. <laughs> page one, um, page one thirty. In the master's discourse, the dominant or commanding position in the upper left-hand corner is filled by S one, the nonsensical signifier, the signifier with no rhyme or reason. In a word, the master signifier. The master must be obeyed, not because we'll all be better off that way or for some other such rationale, but because he or she says so. No justification is given for his or her power. It just is. The master, represented here by S1, addresses that addressing is represented by the arrow. The slave, represented by S2, who is situated in the position of the worker in the upper right-hand corner, also referred to by Lacan as the position of the other. The slave, in slaving away for the master, learns something. He or she comes to embody knowledge, knowledge as productive, represented here by S2. The master is unconcerned with knowledge. As long as everything works, as long as his or her power is maintained or grows, all is well. He or she has no interest in knowing how or why things work. Taking the capitalist as master here and the worker as slave, object A in brackets, Appearing in the lower right-hand corner represents the surplus produced, surplus value. That surplus deriving from the activity of the worker is appropriated by the capitalist, and we might suppose that it directly or indirectly procures the latter enjoyment of some kind, surplus jouissance. The master must show no weakness, and therefore carefully hides the fact that he or she like everyone else, is a being of language and has succumbed to symbolic castration. The split between conscious and unconscious th brought on by the signifier is veiled in the master's discourse and shows up in the position of truth, dissimilated truth. The various positions in each of the four discourses can now be designated as follows. So there's on the left, agent over truth, and then an arrow to other over product loss. Whichever math theme Lacan places in one of these four positions, it takes on the role ascribed to that position. The other three discourses are generated from the first by rotating each element counterclockwise, one quarter of a turn, or revolution. One might suppose that these further or derivative discourses either came into being, or at least were grasped later in time. This seems true of at least the last two of the four, for the analyst's discourse only came into being at the end of the 19th century, and it was the analyst's discourse that eventually allowed the hysterics discourse to be grasped. The master's discourse had long since been recognized by Hegel. The University Discourse For centuries, knowledge has been pursued as a defense against truth. That's a quote from Lacan, from Seminar 13. In the discourse of the university, and again, there's a math, a math theme, I guess is the term. Uh, so page 132, if you want to see it. Knowledge replaces the nonsensical master signifier in the dominant commanding position. Systematic knowledge is the ultimate authority, reigning in the stead of blind will, and everything has its reason. Lacan almost goes so far as suggest a sort of historical movement from the master's discourse to the university discourse, the university discourse providing a sort of legitimation or rationalization of the master's will. In that sense, he seems to agree with the argument put forward in the 1960s and 1970s that the university is an arm of capitalist production or of the military-industrial complex, as it was called at the time suggesting that the truth hidden behind the university discourse is, after all, the master signifier. Knowledge here interrogates surplus value, the product of capitalist economies, 
which takes the form of a loss or subtraction of value from the worker and rationalizes or justifies it. The product or loss here is the divided alienated subject. Since the agent in the university discourses the knowing subject, the unknowing subject or subject of the unconscious is produced, but at the same time excluded. Philosophy, Lacan says, has always served the master, has always placed itself in the service of rationalizing and propping up the master's discourse, as has the worst kind of science. <laughs> Note that whereas Lacan at first associates the university discourse with scientific formalization, with the increasing mathematization of science, he later dissociates true scientific work from the university discourse, associating it instead with the hysterics discourse. Surprising as that may seem at first, Lacan's view of genuine scientific activity, explained in Science and Truth, for example, does correspond to the structure of the hysterics discourse, as I shall try to explain it below. <clears throat> that shift is reflected in television by an association of the scientific and hysterics discourses, and a total equation of them in Propos sur l'hysterie, a talk given in Belgium in 1975. It implies that the kind of knowledge involved in the university discourse amounts to mere rationalization, in the most perjurative Freudian sense of the term. We can imagine it, not as the kind of thought that tries to come to grips with the real, to maintain the difficulties posed by apparent logical and or physical contradictions, but rather as a kind of encyclopedic endeavor to exhaust a field. Consider Charles Fourier's 810 personality types and Auguste Comte's goal of a total sociology. Working in the service of the master signifier, more or less any kind of argument will do, as long as it takes on the guise of reason and rationality. The Hysterics Discourse In the Hysterics Discourse, which is actually the fourth generated by the succession of quarter turns, not the third as I am presenting it here, and then there's a math theme thing, so page 133 if you want to see it, the split subject occupies the dominant position and addresses S1, calling it into question. Whereas the University Discourse takes its cue from the Master Signifier, glossing over it with some sort of trumped-up system, the hysteric goes at the master and demands that he or she show his or her stuff, prove his or her metal by producing something serious by way of knowledge. The hysterics discourse is the exact opposite of the university discourse, all the positions being reversed. The hysteric maintains the primacy of subjective division, the contradiction between conscious and unconscious, and thus the conflictual or self-contradictory nature of desire itself. In the lower right-hand corner, we find knowledge, S2. This position is also the one where Lacan situates jouissance, the pleasure produced by a discourse, and he thus suggests here that an hysteric gets off on knowledge. Knowledge is perhaps eroticized to a greater extent in the hysteric's discourse than elsewhere. In the master's discourse, knowledge is prized only insofar as it can produce something else, only so long as it can be put to work for the master. Yet knowledge itself remains inaccessible to the master. In the university discourse, knowledge is not so much an end in itself as that which justifies the academic's very existence and activity. Hysteria thus provides a unique configuration with respect to knowledge, and I believe this is why Lacan finally identifies the discourse of science with that of hysteria. In 1970, in Seminar 17, Lacan views science as having the same structure as the master's discourse. He seems to see it as serving the master, as did classical philosophy. By 1973, in television, Lacan claims that the discourse of science and the discourse of the hysteric are almost identical, and in 1975, he identifies them quite unreservedly. What leads him to do so? Consider Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. In simple terms, it states that we cannot precisely know both a particle's position and its momentum at the same time. If we have been able to ascertain one parameter, the other must necessarily remain unknown. In and of itself, that is a startling proposition for a scientist to put forward. 
Naively, we often think of scientists as people who relentlessly refine their instruments until they can measure everything, regardless of its infinitesimal proportions or blinding speed. Heisenberg, however, posited a limit to our ability to measure, and thus a true limit to scientific knowledge. If for a moment we view scientific knowledge as a whole or a set, albeit expanding, we could imagine it as an ideal set of all scientific knowledge, present and future. Then Heisenberg can be understood as saying that the set is incomplete. The whole is not whole, for there is an unfillable whole in the set. Um, now there's figure 9.1 um, on page 134. Now that is similar to what Lacan says of the hysteric. The hysteric pushes the master, incarnated in a partner, teacher, or whomever, to the point where he or she can find the master's knowledge lacking. Either the master does not have an explanation for everything, or his or her reasoning does not hold water. In addressing the master, the hysteric demands that he or she produce knowledge and then goes on to disprove his or her theories. Historically speaking, hysterics have been a true motor force behind the medical, psychiatric, and psychoanalytic elaboration of theories concerning hysteria. Hysterics led Freud to develop psychoanalytic theory in practice, all the while proving to him in his consulting room the inadequacy of his knowledge and know-how. <coughs> hysterics, like good scientists, do not set out to desperately explain everything with the knowledge they already have, that is the job of the systematizer or even the encyclopedist, nor do they take for granted that all the solutions will be someday forthcoming. Heisenberg shocked the physics community when he asserted that there was something that structurally speaking could not be known, something that it is impossible for us to know, a kind of conceptual anomaly. Similar problems and paradoxes have arisen in logic and mathematics, as we saw in chapter 3 and 7 above. In Lacan's terminology, these impossibilities are related to the real that goes by the name of object A in brackets. Now in the hysterics discourse, object A in brackets appears in the position of truth. That means that the truth of the hysterics discourse, its hidden motor force, is the real. Physics, too, when carried out in a truly scientific spirit, is ordained and commanded by the real. That is, by that which does not work by that which does not fit. It does not set out to carefully cover over paradoxes and contradictions in an attempt to prove that the theory is nowhere lacking, that it works in every instance, but rather to take such paradoxes and contradictions as far as they can go. The Analyst's Discourse. Let us turn now to analytic discourse. And there is a math theme, page 135. Object A in brackets, as cause of desire, is the agent here, occupying the dominant or commanding position. The analyst plays the part of pure desirousness, pure desiring subject, and interrogates the subject in his or her division, precisely at those points where the split between conscious and unconscious shows through. Slips of the tongue, bungled and unintended acts, slurred speech, dreams, etc., in this way, the analyst sets the patient to work, to associate, and the product of that lab laborious association is a new master signifier. The patient, in a sense, coughs up a master signifier that has not yet been brought into relation with any other signifier. In discussing the discourse of the master, I referred to S1 as the signifier with no rhyme or reason. As it appears concretely in the analytic situation, a master signifier presents itself as a dead end, a stopping point, a term, word, or phrase that puts an end to association, that grinds the patient's discourse to a halt. As we saw in chapter 6, it could be a proper name, the patient's or the analyst's, a reference to the death of a loved one, the name of a disease, AIDS, cancer, psoriasis, blindness, or a variety of other things. The task of analysis is to bring such master signifiers into relation with other signifiers, that is, to dialectize the master signifiers it produces. That involves reliance upon the master's discourse, or as we might see it here, recourse to the fundamental structure of signification. A link must be established between each master signifier and a binary signifier, such that subjectification takes place. 
The symptom itself may present itself as a master signifier. In fact, as analysis proceeds and as more and more aspects of a person's life are taken as symptoms, each symptomatic activity or pain may present itself in the analytic work as a word or phrase that simply is. This seems to signify nothing to the subject. In Seminar 20, Lacan refers to S1 in the analyst's discourse as la bêtise, stupidity or funny business, a reference back to the case of little Hans, who refers to his own horse phobia as la bêtise, as Lacan translates it. It is a piece of nonsense produced by the analytic process itself. S2 appears in analytic discourse in the place of truth, lower left-hand position. S2 represents knowledge here, but obviously not the kind of knowledge that occupies the dominant position in the university discourse. The knowledge in question here is unconscious knowledge, that knowledge that is caught up in the signifying chain and has yet to be subjectified. Where that knowledge was, the subject must come to be. Now, according to Lacan, while the analyst adopts the analytic discourse, the analysand is inevitably, in the course of analysis, hystericized. The analysand, regardless of his or her clinical structure, whether phobic, perverse, or obsessive-compulsive, is backed into the hysterics discourse. There's another Matheme, page 136. Why is that? Because the analyst puts the subject as divided, as self-contradictory on the firing line, so to speak. The analyst does not question the obsessive neurotics theories about Dostoevsky's poetics, for example, attempting to show the neurotic where his or her intellectual views are inconsistent. Such an, such an obsessive may attempt to speak during his or her analytic sessions from the position of S2 in the university, academic discourse, but to engage the analysand at that level allows the analysand to maintain that particular stance. Instead, the analyst ignoring, we can imagine, the whole of a half-hour-long critique of Bakhtin's views on Dostoevsky's dialogic style may focus on the slightest slip of the tongue or ambiguity in the analysand's speech. The analysand's use, for example, of the graphic metaphor near misses to describe her bad timing in the publishing of her article on Bakhtin, when the analyst knows that this analysand had fled her country of origin shortly after rejecting an unexpected and unwanted marriage proposal. Near misses. Oh. Thus, the analyst, by pointing to the fact that the analysand is not the master of his or her own discourse, and states the analysand is divided between conscious speaking subject and some other subject speaking at the same time through the same mouthpiece, as agent of a discourse wherein the S1s produced in the course of analysis are interrogated and made to yield their links with S2, as in the hysterics discourse. Clearly, the motor force of the process is object A in brackets, the analyst operating as pure desirousness. The Social Situation of Psychoanalysis I mentioned earlier that psychoanalysis is not in and of itself a discourse of power, it does not collapse into the master's discourse. Yet in Americans' view of the Lacanian psychoanalytic scene, both in France and elsewhere, often encompasses little more than the power struggles engaged in by individual analysts in schools against other analysts in schools. Insofar as psychoanalysis is a social practice, it obviously operates in social and political environments that contain competing and oftentimes antagonistic discourses. Um, medical discourse promoting the physiological basis and treatment of mental disorders, scientific and philosophical discourses, aiming at undermining the theoretical and clinical foundations of psychoanalysis, political and economic discourses seeking to reduce the length and, length and cost of psychoanalytic therapy, psychological discourse hoping to attract patients to its own adherence, and so on. In such circumstances, psychoanalysis becomes one political lobbyist among many, and can do no more than attempt to defend its right to exist in ever-changing political contexts. In Paris and other cities where Lacanian psychoanalysis has become a major movement, individuals and schools compete for theoretical and or clinical dominance, 
vying for political influence, university support, hospital positions, patients, and simple popularity. Is that a necessary outgrowth of psychoanalytic discourse as we see it operating in the analytic setting? I think not. It may certainly have a negative impact upon an individual analyst's ability to completely adhere to analytic discourse in the analytic setting, but it does not seem to be inherent to analytic discourse as such. This claim will no doubt be disputed by many, given psychoanalysis's long history of schisms and infighting but it would sustain that the latter results from the adoption of other discourses by analysts as soon as institutionalization begins. The formation of schools, the consolidation of doctrine, the training of new analysts, the stipulation of licensing requirements, etc., not from analytic discourse itself. There are limits to the extent to which analytic discourse can and should be adhered to in contexts other than the analytic setting. There's no such thing as a meta language. There is no such thing as a meta language or meta discourse that would somehow escape the limitations of the discourses thus far discussed. For one is always operating within a particular discourse, even as one talks about discourse in general terms. Psychoanalysis is, psychoanalysis's claim to fame does not reside in providing an Archimedean point outside of discourse but simply in elucidating the structure of discourse itself. Every discourse requires a loss of jouissance and has its own mainspring or truth, often carefully dissimilated. Each discourse defines that loss differently, starting from a different mainspring. Marx elucidated certain features of capitalist discourse, and Lacan elucidates features of other discourses as well. It is not until we have identified the features peculiar to a discourse that we can know how it operates. When Lacan first presents the four discourses, he seems to suggest there are no others. Does that mean that every conceivable form of discourse activity comes under one of those four? I shall leave that question open until the next chapter in which I take up the question of science.